the last time these three cycles converged, the whole world changed. Now, this is your guide and what you need to be doing and prepared for right now. Now, it's clear the world we are going into is not the same as the one that we're leaving behind. Anyone paying attention can see that the entire world is going through massive changes, political, social, cultural, all those structures are changing. We have technological advancements that are coming in fast and the global financial system as we know it is almost out of options. It's out of moves and when you're playing a game, and you run out of moves, what do you do? Well, you have to reset the game, of course, right? Which makes sense as to why the voice of, you know, the World Economic Forum is calling for what they say, the Great Reset and their agenda for that. And it's become so loud, but there's three factors to consider that could help hurt or otherwise affect the global elite's plans. Now, understanding history helps us to know what's happening now, but more importantly, it unlocks the keys for the future. By understanding human nature and progress, and to understand and to make sense of this, we have to look at three key areas together, right? These cycles, three cycles, and really three revolutions will help us to really understand the impact as well as where they're going. Now, what's happening to the world isn't just about deleveraging. It's not about inflation, deflation, not only. Instead, it's much bigger. It's much deeper than that. And we're watching all of this happen in real time. We're witnessing the greatest revolution since the late 1700s, which gave us democracy, the industrial revolution, and free market capitalism. Now, American philosopher George Santayana said, those who forget history are condemned to repeat it. And this means that while we must look forward to the future, we must also learn from the lessons of the past. So we don't make the same mistakes and even better, we can use these lessons to our advantage. So to help you learn the key lessons from the past so we can better understand what's going on in the world today and more importantly, where we're going into the future so we can prepare and protect our family, finances, and freedoms. All right, now, let's. we got a lot to talk about. It's one of the biggest subjects I've tackled. It's kind of my life's work, but before we dig in, if you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss, and I make these videos because I want to change the way you think about money. I want to take complex subjects, scary subjects, and I want to make them easy to understand, and more importantly for you, so they're actionable, so you can have the knowledge and you can take action to save yourself, your friends, and your family. Now, if you like these topics and want to help me reach more people with these topics, take one quick second, click on that like button so the algorithm sends it out to more people. All right, now, these are really big topics. This is This is... I don't want to say my life's work, but it's something I've been studying for years and years. And I'm going to do my best to cover them and I'm going to break them into three different videos because it's a big topic, three different videos. If you want to understand the whole picture and even more importantly than the whole picture is what you need to be doing right now to prepare, then you might want to come to my free event that I'm going to be doing where I'm going to break all of this down and I'm going to show you the actionable things that I'm doing. And so you can just copy and you can do the same things for yourself, you know, and these will help you get more freedom, you know, more money. Uh, build up your legacy. All right, now there's a link in the description of this video if you want to come to that free event that I'm doing where I'm going to put all this together for you. Um, but let's go ahead and jump in. All right, now, as I said, this is something that I have been studying for years and years and years, a, a decade or more. And if you watch my videos on a regular basis, you know that I try to always pull historical narratives in because I believe it's that history that helps to understand where we're at and more importantly, where we're going. And so if you like my historical narratives, then you are going to love this video. Now, I apologize in advance because this video is going to be long and it's even bigger than that because it's going to be a three-part video series. It's that big. Um, this is my thesis that pulls all of history forward and tells us where we are and where we're going. So I apologize in advance. It's going to be long, but it's going to be worth it. Now, I am talking about three revolutionary cycles, three revolutionary cycles that are actually converging right now. Now, what does that mean? Well, uh, well, before we break all that down, the three cycles we're talking about are one, a PSC. This is the one we're going to talk about today. Uh, I call this my political, social and cultural cycles and revolutions. All right. The second cycle that we are going to discuss on the next video and that's converging right now is a technological cycle and there's technological revolutions. There's only been six so far. Um, and then there's the financial cycles and revolutions and all three of these are converging at once. And when cycles converge, they are 
huge. Now, cycles is something that I study over and over. Now, back to that quote, right? Those who don't know history are bound to repeat it. And the reason why we have to know history is because it cycles. It continues to repeat over and over and over. Now, the reason why cycles matter is because we can see um, the same things playing out over and over and over again. That helps us to prepare. What helps to understand what we're going through gives us that staying power, but also helps us prepare for the future. Now, cycles come in all different lengths. All right, there's four year cycles and eight year cycles and 24 and 28 and 100 and 250 and all these different cycles. Um, and each one has different amounts of power, um, different, amount, different amount of size and impact that they make. So a lot of these cycles we're gonna talk about today repeat in sections of three. And then on the third one, it's the most powerful. Um, you can see kind of in this illustration here, how you have a bigger one, a medium one, a smaller one, but they all converge right here. And that is the point that we wanna study. That's what we're looking at today. Now, like I said, in this sector, we're going to be looking at um, three cycles. There's a 28-year cycle that happens times three. So 28 times three gives us an 84-year cycle. 84 times three gives us a 250-year cycle. So these are the ones that we're going to be breaking down. Um, notice how they break down in math like that. Now, it's interesting, um, and if you study technical analysis, you understand that it's all based on mathematics. And it's interesting that, it's, that, that it goes on mathematics but that's how the world is. There's things in the world called natural law, we're gonna to get to in a minute. Uh, but if you look at the four seasons, which we're also gonna discuss, um, the four seasons are kind of broken down mathematically. Now they don't start and stop on the exact hour, minute and day, but more or less, give or take, it's about um, even, right? And like I said, when they converge, that's when fireworks happen, that's when they amplify. Now, to understand how these cycles actually play out, you have to understand a couple things, all right? So the way that history progresses, the way that humankind's progress, now this is all important. Uh, before I go into that, let me, let me just tell you that in order to understand where your money is going, what's gonna happen with our money, what we should do with our money. We have to understand the PSE, political, social, cultural things, because that drives it. That drives it then to technology and then technology drives to financial. The reason why is because everything is push and pull. Everything's reactionary. And so when one thing happens, it gets too far of a done and then the other one happens. We're gonna get into that. But the way that history progresses um, has, has a rate. Now there's linear versus exponential. Now this is a key piece to understand because most people think that progress, humankind progress is linear. And what that means is that it would increase by a constant difference. So um, if you're this person right here, you think that it's linear, like where you think you're gonna end up. You see, pro you see progress and you understand that you're getting better and better and better and you're learning more and technology is improving all those things. And you see this steady up up, up climb, right? And you know it's gonna be there, all right? So that's linear. Well, some people think, well, no, I understand that it's gonna progress even way faster. So you think that you, well, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna adjust and I think we're gonna end up being here, right? The problem is, is that most growth is actually exponential. So instead of, instead of increasing at a constant difference, it increases by a ratio. And so where we actually end up is somewhere way up here and we never realize that. And so that's the most important thing. Um, we're gonna talk about that in, this, in the next video as we get to technological revolutions. Uh, but this one right now, like I said, we're really looking at political, cultural, social, all right? Because human nature drives all of those things. Now, history progresses um, in accordance to natural law. So what is natural law? Well, natural law are things in the universe that are natural. So gravity, for example, is a natural law. Um, gravity is a law that we can't beat. Now with enough money and enough technology, we can suspend gravity temporarily, but we're always going to have to adhere to that. All right, now human nature has us pushing forward, progressing into certain things. And this is just natural humanity, human nature. And so there is a drive for freedom. Humans want to um, design, create, they want to imagine, they want freedom to do those things, freedom to talk, freedom to discuss, all those things. That is a that is a inalienable right that was put in the US Constitution, but it's part of human nature. There's this natural law that wants that. There's also a natural law for affluence. And so you hear about like abundance or scarcity mindsets, for example, but there's this natural progression to affluence. And so that think about the world. You know, a few hundred years ago, everything was in dirt. Everything in the world that we have today was created. 
So from the skyscrapers to the cars, to the computers, to the spaceships, to the satellites, everything in the world was created. And so there's this drive of humanity, of human beings to create, like I said here in the freedom, but to create. And so affluence, we want to be better off. We want to work less. We want to make things easier. We want to have, have better things. So there's affluence. And then ultimately, this is a big one that we've lost today, but this is a big, important piece. We're going to come back to it um, a little bit later, but meritocracy. So what does that mean? Well, that means that, um, I'm rewarded for the actions that I do. So, um, if you're going to college, for example, you are trying to get good grades and so you can get a good job, right? And so you don't go to parties um, and uh, you stay home and you study and you stay up all night late and so you can get those grades. Now, some people don't. Some people don't really care. Some people don't stay up late. Some people don't study and they don't get good grades. So, But you're judged based off of the performance that you provide and that's how the whole world is. Now, the lion wakes up in the morning knowing that if it doesn't run faster than the slowest gazelle, it's going to die. It's going to starve to death. The gazelle wakes up knowing if it doesn't run faster than the fastest lion, it's going to be, it's going to be a meal. It's going to die. And so the whole world is set to, the ant stores food for the winter, right? And so the whole world is based off of meritocracy. If you don't work, you don't eat. Now we've seemed to lost that. Uh, but that is again, back to natural law. And we're going to come back to that piece in a little bit later. All right. Now, there's, um, that's the way that history progresses, uh, exponential, not linear. Those are the reasons why, because human nature wants us to progress to those things. But there's also triggers, all right? There's triggers that really spark this type of progress. And so really, as I was kind of saying before, it's kind of reactionary. And so progress is always a solution to a problem. It's always a solution to a problem. Um, I'm carrying one rock at a time and that's a problem. It takes too long. So I create a wheelbarrow so I could put all the rocks in. It's a solution to my problem. And so that's how businesses, that's how entrepreneurs are formed, right? Entrepreneurs go solve problems and they get rewarded by people, by customers, giving them money for solving those problems that they had. All right. But there's also things that we need con to continue having progress. And these are natural laws, but of course, somehow man, or I should say centralized control, which we're going to break down a little bit. Centralized control is trying to defeat this. And so the future for growth and the future, we need these three things. We need recessions. And so the Fed, the central banks are doing everything they can to make sure we never have another recession. As a matter of fact, Janet Yellen said that she doesn't forecast we'll ever have another recession in our lifetime, but we need them. We need recessions, just like a forest needs to clear out the underbrush. We need to wipe out malinvestment. We need to wipe out bad businesses. It's just part of the natural evolutionary cycle, um, survival of the fittest, if you will. We also need revolutions. We need things to radically change because what happens is legacy systems kind of entrench themselves and make it so change can't happen. But again, if we want to progress, if we want growth, the old way has to die. It needs to die. We need that revolution. Um, it needs to be sparked. And then eventually, uh, also, we need disruptive technology. Back to disruptors, of course, market disruptors. That's, where, that's why I call it this. But disruptive technology gets rid of the old way to usher in a new way. All right. So those are the triggers that we have with progress. Now, the difference with growth, uh, especially in cycles, is that growth is always changing. So back to this, right? So growth is kind of going like this, but cycles are repeating. And so this is one key differentiator here so that people think again, like I said, that we continue to grow, which we do, but within that, we have these cycles that continue to repeat. And then when we get to this final cycle, then we start like a whole new one. And then these cycles will repeat etc. All right. So they're repeating, but also cycles are reactive. And so what do I mean by that? Um, the actions of one cause the next one to happen. I'm going to break this down a little bit further, but kind of like in this uh, model, right? When the ball hits, it transfers the energy and it reacts and it sends the ball up the other way. Now, I understand this is uh, not your typical financial information, but it's important for me to under, uh, for you to understand this, for me to set this stage, because the PSC, political, social, cultural, is what drives the technological, which then drives the financial. And if you really want to understand where we're at right now, and more importantly, how to navigate these next five to 10 years, this is ultimately important. Now, um, the cycles also have stages in them, all right? So um, again, they're reactionary. So we have periods of extreme optimism 
and extreme pessimism. So this is a, typically a bear and a bull. Um, that's kind of where they got those names. Um, and so there's a uh, a time where everybody's over exuberant about the market and it's never gonna crash and everybody's happy and everybody wants to jump in. And then when it sells off, everybody's mad and I can't believe I lost my money and I'm never gonna invest again. And so those are the things, but it cycles between those things. And there's also the four seasons. And so the four seasons, kind of like you can see here, of course, summer, spring, winter, fall. We kind of talked about that in the beginning. Um, even nature has these cycles. And we can look at these, and I want to jump into this a little bit later, but winter would be like the hard times, right? And the hard times create strong men. Spring is then the strong men create good times. That's where the growth is starting to happen. The summer is then good times. Um, unfortunately, it brings weak men. And then the fall, weak men and hard times. We're going to talk about that a little bit deeper in a minute. But I just want to remember, I want you to remember that PSE, political, social, cultural, and technology cycle, so those two cycles together, are what drive the financial cycle. So if you wanna know what's gonna happen with your life, with your money um, over the next couple of years, because as I said, they are all converging right now. It's pretty amazing what's actually happening. So let's go ahead and jump into first these 80 year cycles or about 84 years on average, plus or minus a couple of years. Um, and I wanna just go back through a couple of them just to kind of give you a, a, a big picture now. I could go on for hours on this and I'm trying to keep it short. But if we look at um, the last 80 year cycle, we have like 1848, this is two cycles ago. And in these 80 year cycles, these are populist uprising. Remember, we're not in technology or finance yet. Right now we're political, social, cultural. So these are populist uprisings. Um, this is about every 80, 84 years, we see a regime change. This is where the old way dies and we get a new one again. There's, there's smaller cycles within this one, but these are the big ones. So if we go back two cycles ago to 1848, we see that's when Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto. So this was a massive shift. Uh, it was the manifesto, which is being researched surface today. Uh, we're going to talk about that when we figure out where we're at and where we're going over the next five to 10 years. Um, but this is when Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto. Well, in addition to that, it, I don't know if uh, specifically sparked it off, but we had the biggest revolution. It was called the Springtime of the People in 1848. And it was the largest revolution that ripped all the way through Europe. It was the most widespread revolutionary wave in history. And you can see just how big that was all through history. Um, and really it was, a, it was a process of getting rid of one system, regime change, and introducing a new one. And so that was removing monarchy and interdependent nation states. So getting rid of getting rid of the king, the monarchy, the single source, and now having more of a system of, of interdependent states. And so those were big things, of course, and that's what ushered in, um, well, I'm not gonna go, go in all the way into that, but you understand. So that's the big one, 1848, a couple of big points. Again, I can go on and on. Now fast forwarding 80 to 84 years, you can see the next one, 1930s. And again, we had regime change again. That was World War II. So 84 years before, we got rid of the monarchies and got the independent states. Then we went into World War II. We saw Hitler and Mussolini both rise to power in that time um, over in Europe. And in the United States, we also saw regime change as well. Now, the country, the United States country didn't change, but something big did change, and that was FDR, President FDR, and the New Deal that he introduced in 32. And although the United States technically was still alive, it was fundamentally transformed. Um, what, do you, what do I mean by that? I kind of have a couple uh, talking points here, but in 1932, when, when Roosevelt was elected president, he signed the, um, a plethora of new programs that were intended to stop the economic freefall. All right? During FDR's first 100 days in office, he demanded broad executive power to wage war against what? Against the emergency. Does that sound familiar? Do we know what Biden has done on this first 100 days? And he's been enacting more and more emergencies, the COVID emergency, the cyber emergency, et cetera, right? So the first 100 days, uh, wage war against the emergency. First 100 days, the Oval Office, he signed 15 major bills. I think Biden's got him beat by over 100. Um, that would become the backbone of his New Deal. And this is the key piece. The onslaught included so-called alphabet soup of programs, um, emergency this, emergency that, et cetera, as well as several others. But it fundamentally transformed the role of the federal government. Before the New Deal, the federal government was relatively small and mostly uninvolved with social and economic engineering. However, 
FDR's New Deal shattered the traditional role of the federal government by increasing its size and scope under the notion, under the notion that only the federal government in a massive intervention could solve the Great Depression. So that was a fundamental shift, a regime change in the United States. And so um, anyway, those are the key points. And then back to 84 years later, bringing us back to current time. And we can start to see that the same seeds are being planted, setting the same things up. So of course, Brexit was a really big deal um, all through Europe. In the United States, we had Trump was elected. He was not establishment. He was elected because he wasn't establishment. He was uh, attacked the whole time and eventually has left office, not establishment. Um, and that is continuing to go on. Um, you can see, as I just kind of mentioned, Biden is kind of doing the same thing to FDR. So you can see that this 84 year cycle is holding up. In Europe, we had the Yellow Jackets. And of course, in the United States, we have BLM and Antifa again rising up. So you can see the seeds are being planted for the same thing. Of course, we don't know these cycles until we look backwards on them. And so just like any cycle, whether these are financial markets for the price of Bitcoin or your favorite stock, um, we don't know tops or bottoms until we look back on it, but we can see the seeds are being planted now. Now back to the populist uprising pre-pandemic. So before the pandemic, there's a lot of stuff going on since the pandemic. Pre-pandemic, there was 10 countries with over 1 million people each in the streets uprising. All right. This has uh, since 2017, just since 2017, there's been 230 significant anti-government protests. There's been 110 countries that have experienced it. 78% of authoritarian leaning countries have faced significant protests. And 25 significant protests have directly related to the coronas rise, but we're not talking about those. Um, for kind of a listing of that, I pulled this up. So that's 10 countries with a million people each. Here's a listing of them. Hong Kong, 2 million people. Bolivia, 1.5. South Korea, 1.5. Uh, India, a million. Lebanon, a million. United States, Algeria, Chile, Colombia, United Kingdom, France, and Togo. Um, so that's all of those countries right there are doing it. So again, you can see that that cycle is definitely building up right now. And then we have this, uh, as I said, right, it's kind of like reactionary. It's imagine like if you went bowling, if you've ever done that before, and you, um, you put the bumpers up in the gutters for your kids, right? And they bowl the ball and it hits one side and then it reacts, hits the other side. And then it hits the other side and it hits the other side. So it's reactive. And that's sort of how these are. And so the pendulum swings back from a we to a me. So what does that mean? So a we is collectivism, it's globalism, it's we're all in this together. And then eventually that gets so um, overdone that it swings back to the other side, which is me, which is individualism, which is um, I've got this figured out on my own. And so we go from one extreme to the other, always finding, trying to find that equilibrium, but always going back and forth. Now, um, this also coincides with these 80 year cycles, which is pretty interesting. And so we have peak centralization, where we get to peak globalization, centralization, and then we go back to decentralization. But peak, peak was in 1783, uh, the, uh, the US won the war, the Revolutionary War, the US Constitution. Um, we had the 1979 was the French Revolution that followed. Um, the Gettysburg Address, 1872, all men are created equal. Um, the Statue of Liberty was uh, starting to get created at that same time. Um, 1943, so these are all 80 years apart. Hitler, Stalin um, came to power. The UN was formed. The IMF, International Monetary Fund, Central Bank of Central Banks was formed. Bretton Woods, um, was, which was the One World Currency Agreement, was formed. So all of these things were done. That's peak globalization, peak centralization. And of course, here we are 2023, um, 80 years later, and we have the World Economic Forum telling us that we're gonna have this great reset, they're gonna do it. We have all these three letter organizations, the World Economic Forum, the World um, Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, the World Meteorological Association, the IMF, the UN. And so you can see that we are definitely peak centralization or peak globalization, or definitely headed on our way there right now. But then the pendulum gets swinging back the other way. It leaves that centralization, that globalization, and goes back to a decentralization, back to me, back to individualization. And so we can see peak decentralization, 1823, President, President James Monroe said the US would not be subject to European powers anymore. Uh, 1903, Roosevelt said, speak softly and carry a big stick. That's individualism. 1983, Reagan said, tear down that wall. 
tear down the wall. Um, and so those are peak decentralization cycles. And so again, you can see that that 80 year cycle is holding up over and over and over. All right, now there's another 80 year cycle that also coincides, corresponds with this, and it's called generational theory. And again, this is back to reactionary. So different generations respond to the generation before them and they keep starting the cycle. So in this case, there's four 20 year cycles that of course add up to this 80 years. Um, and these four cycles are represented as this high, um, the awakening, things start unraveling, eventually leads to a crisis. And that crisis then starts the cycle back over again. We come back up, back to a high, let's create things new. Um, the awakening, everybody wakes up to it and it recycles. You might've heard of this generational theory. It's also called the fourth turning. And you've probably seen this before, the fourth turning I mentioned it earlier, where hard times, the high, the, hard, or the crisis, the hard times create strong men. Good men have to rise up in order to deal with that. Right? Then we go to, well, these strong men create great times. They've turned things around, things are better than ever, they've created these great times. The problem is though, is that those good times then create weak men. Um, there's all those people that never had to work for it, they've been living off from the past, and so they've created uh, weak, weak men, have created good, uh, good times create weak men, and then unfortunately, the weak men create hard times. And this cycle's over, hard times equal, um, bring strong men. Now, what's interesting to understand about this is that you can kind of see where we're at today. And so the hard times created strong men, the strong men created good times. And so two generations before us created massive wealth inside the world, inside the developed world, the United States, Europe, created massive wealth. Um, and they built up massive infrastructure and built up lots of capital stockpiles. But then we have generations, the good times created weak men. We have people that, generations that have lived off of the wealth of the past. They've started to lose reality. Now today we have two generations of people who have never worked or produced. They don't understand what that's like. They're living off of the past. They're living off of the good times that were created from two generations before them. The problem is, is they have lost touch with reality. They've lost touch with natural law, which is the lion knows if it doesn't work, it's going to starve. The gazelle knows if it doesn't work, it's going to die. And so that is the natural law. We can't get away from that. And unfortunately we have academia and politicians who have never lived in that world. And they're making decisions for you and for I based off of faulty data because they've never lived in that natural law. And that's where these weak men create the bad times again. Now back to generational um, theory, I guess I kind of just talked about that. Um, we have like the law of gravity. So I kind of mentioned earlier, with enough money and technology, you can suspend gravity temporarily, but you're always gonna have to adhere to that. Now, no matter who you are, you can be the richest man in the world. And if you fall off of something high, you're probably gonna die. Doesn't matter about how much money you have, right? Um, there's also the law of sowing and reaping. Again, natural law, back to the gazine and the, and, and the, and the, and the lion. Um, you, you must sow before you reap. I have to plant before I can harvest. I must produce before I consume. These are natural laws. And like I said, they can be suspended for enough period of time, but they always have to be adhered to. And that's where these weak men are creating these hard times because they don't understand these lessons. They're living off of the good times that were created on two generations before them. And the other thing that's um, interesting in generational theory or the fourth turning, in this fourth turning, this is the key piece, massive change happens in a short amount of time. So I think it was Vladimir Lenin, he said that there's days where nothing seems to happen and then there's um, days where decades seem to happen, something like that. And the point is, is that sometimes nothing happens and then sometimes massive change happens in a short period of time. And that's really indicative of this fourth turning right here, this is where massive change happens in a short period of time. And that's what's important to understand for right now is we are in this fourth period. And so we are witnessing the world changing at a rapid pace. I think everybody could agree to that. But the amount of change that's going to happen is going to blow your minds. Now, again, back to the World Economic Forum, they have an agenda. Their goal is by 2030, you own nothing and you're happy apparently. Um, and so over the next 10 years, they want to change the world. Klaus Schwab, the head of the EWF, says that it's time to call a great reset of the world. And so there's massive change that's coming. And you have to understand that in that fourth turning, it begins with a catalyst. There's something big that sparks this off. 
And in this place, we can kind of look back at the beginning of this fourth turning period. Um, back in 2008, we had the great financial crash. Now, this, this was not a United States thing. This was a global financial crash. And that was really what started to spark this whole thing off. That's when this quantitative easing got going, when the bank started printing unlimited amounts of money. And then we have, of course, the 2020 global pandemic, which has just even further pushed this thing home. And it's accelerated things uh, across all the boards at a very, very, very rapid rate. Now, that's the 80 year cycles. Now let's go to the 250 year cycles. Now, um, three 28 year cycles equals an 84 year cycle. All right, we talked about that. And then we have, um, that's wrong, three, three 84 year cycles equals a 252 year cycle. So I just went through the three 84 year cycles and now let's look at the 250 year revolutionary cycle because this one is the big one. Um, so back to this, we kind of have these smaller ones that can fit inside of it. And that equals a big 250 year revolutionary cycle. Now, there's a couple things that we can look at this. Um, there's a book written, The Fate of Empires by General Sir John Glubb. He talks about this pretty extensively. And he talked about, um, he talked about there being about eight cycles on the fate of empires. And so there's first the outburst. Um, this would be the outburst, then we have the conquest, the commerce, the affluence, the intellect, the decadence, the decline, and then finally the collapse. So whether you want to break it into three or four or eight or 10, it doesn't really matter. It all kind of spells the same thing. But in the United States, we can see that the outburst was 1776. Again, that's about 250 years ago. Um, and then we had the outburst, the conquest, 1808, 1809, commerce, etc. And now back down to the collapse, which brings us to about 2023, which is about two years from now. And so you can see that cycle. Um, it was also put together by, um, in the late 1700s, by Alexander Teitler. And he kind of has the same thing that democracy, he calls this is a democracy cycle, also has a lifetime cycle. And you go from this bondage, which is this crisis, right? Which is uh, people are slaves, which is sort of like the amount of control that's being exerted today. And then it goes to a new faith. This is something, let, let, let's recreate things. Let's have faith for the future. Um, courage, people fight. Liberty, people want um, freedom, prosperity. They've achieved it. Back to that's a human nature drive. Um, then we go to abundance, selfishness, complacency. All right, so the good times brought about the weak men. Now they're complacent. The complacency goes to apathy. That's the bad times. They become dependent on the state. Does that sound familiar? Um, UBI, <laughs> sending out checks to everybody. The whole world, as a matter of fact, has been shut down for the pandemic. And now the IMF is giving them money. So now they're dependent, dependent on the IMF. People in the United States are dependent on UBI. And that ultimately, of course, leads to bondage. The Bible says that the borrower is servant to the lender. And so you become a servant, you become bondage. And so we can see this cycle repeating over and over, no matter how you want to slice and dice that. Uh, but let me give you a couple examples. So let's go back and let's just look at the previous two that we've had. And it's important to understand these so you can understand where we're going right now. So in 1517, we had the Protestant Reformation. And it really started right here when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the door of the church. And that is what really kicked it off. Now, at that time, the Roman Catholic Church and the government were together and they, they ruled as the government and they really used um, the Bible, they used religion as a tool to manipulate. Uh, you know, I always say centralization always leads to manipulation. So they centralized that power, centralized that control. And at that time, what really sparked it or what really characterized, I should say, that revolution was an end on the dependence of the Catholic Church. So an end to centralization. Centralization had been controlled or had been uh had been acquired by the church and they ended that dependence um, and they moved to an independent relationship with God. And so the Catholic Church said, the only way that you can get um, uh, religion or, or come to God is through us. We're the gatekeeper. You have to come through us. We have the Bible. We're going to tell you what it says. And once people got that, and we can go back 77 years to the creation of the printing press, um, once people were able to get the Bible, read the information for themselves, they said, wait a minute. 
what you've been telling us is completely wrong. We don't need you anymore. And so we went left centralization of church uh, and control to decentralization where people could now have a, a dependent, uh, independent relationship. Now, what's important to understand about this is we're also seeing the same thing play out now. Uh, I'll jump to that in a minute. But the internet, 77 years earlier, not exactly that, um, did the same thing. Now we have the information. We don't rely on the same three news channels and the same three newspapers to give us our information. Today we get information all over the place and more and more we're starting to see how these centralized entities, governments and bodies, etc., aren't able to keep a lid on the information. The information's out there today. And so we are, are rejecting that centralized control. We're moving towards um, decentralization. All right, let's fast forward 250 years. We have the birth of democracy, 1776. That was the founding of the United States. <coughs> the birth of democracy was the declaration of what? Of independence. So we're rejecting that monarchy, rejecting that the British rule, and we want independence, declaration of independence. Um, that was also the birth of free market capitalism. So it wasn't just the political, social, cultural. Uh, remember, PSC plus technology, he, uh, drives finance. So it also gave us free market capitalism to change the financial structure of the world. Uh, we saw Adam Smith, one of the classical economists. Um, he published five different versions of his book, The Wealth of Nations, uh, which is still an amazing read and uh, one that you might want to put on your reading list. I recommend it. He talked about the invisible hand of the market. Um, and really, we combined capitalism plus democracy. So we combined uh, political, social, cultural with financial and we got an explosive revolution. It was really, really big. Um, and then fast forwarding 250 years, which brings us to about where we are here today and uh, somewhere in the 2023, 2026 range. Um, and I think it's easy to see. Uh, I think I've made the case, but even if you haven't, even if you don't believe what I've said or you, or you haven't followed along exactly, you see it. You know that a revolution is coming. Now, it's important to understand a couple of things. I believe there's a revolution coming from a couple different things. First of all, it's a revolution against centralization and globally, globalization. All right, that is the big thing that we're that we're having a revolution against, and really we're seeing it's a drive towards decentralization and populism. All right, now what happens? We have a battle over here on one side. We have the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, the IMF telling us that our agenda is by 2030, you own nothing. We're going to centralize control to the point where you don't own anything. And at the same time, we can see the whole world is rising up in populism. I showed you the numbers um, and rejecting that and wanting decentralization. So what happens? Uh, it's a big mystery box. Well, it's not that big of a mystery if you understand the cycles that I've just broken down for you. So let me kind of recap this a little bit and I'll explain it. So we have these converging cycles, right? As I said, we have these 80 year cycles and then right here, they converge at this point of contact here. Uh, but there's two other cycles that are important. Like I said, this cycle on its own is important. But when you add in the financial cycles and the technological revolutions that we're going to break in the next video, you'll see that when all three of them meet, it's fireworks. It's like putting gas on a fire. Um, and, and like I said, we know change is coming. We have the World Economic Forum telling us. We're going to continue rolling up power by 2030, you own nothing. We have central bank digital currencies rolling out. It's going to be the ultimate surveillance tool to be able to program the money, be able to control your behavior through the money. It's going to be amazing for them. Um, and we're going to get to how to survive all that when we get to part three. All right. But the next cycle, the cycle that we're just moving into, the next one that's going to be starting up, I believe I'm calling for the largest reshuffle since democracy. Of course, it's the largest one since the last cycle, 250 years ago. Um, and it's important to understand a couple things about this. So the Industrial Revolution was also started at the same time, that last 250 year cycle. Remember on the next video, part two, we're going to talk about technological revolutions. And it really started there with the Industrial Revolution. But what's important to understand is that these things are reactionary, right? We've talked about that. So revolutions, um, are reactionary and they end opposite of how they've started. So I, sh I showed you a couple examples of that. So the Industrial Revolution started out um, into a centralization. So it took people from decentralized farms and cottage industry and it started centralizing them into factories and into cities and things like that. So we've gone through that period, but it's the but these these revolutions will end the opposite 
of how they started. And so that's the way that I see that we're going to uh, uh, break down to. Revolutions are sparked by backlashes to populism or ba populism is a backlash to that globalization. And the reason why is that uh, tech is faster than culture. Culture is faster than people. So the technology and globalization is bringing everybody together. And we're seeing this clash of people and it's, it's causing a lot of problem. Now, a lot of people think that globalization equals free market trade and it can. And I don't see that changing at all. As a matter of fact, I see that only increasing. Technology is allowing um, for the world free trade to open up. And that's a good thing. That's an important thing. It's a thing that I think will continue and it should continue. We want more people into the world um, economy, more people on the internet, more people solving problems, seeing different solutions to problems. We want more people contributing, more free trade, more specialization. We want all that. But what we're going to see is a break in this centralized control over that. So um, instead of, we still want the global trade, the global communication, but without the centralized control. And that is where this next cycle is going to push us. It's going to break this, right? We've looked at three, that one cycle was this populist uprising. The other cycle was the, um, the move from centralization to decentralization over here. And then that fits within our 250 year cycle. Now, it's also uh, important to understand um, creative destruction and of course this back to this great reset narrative and so creative destruction basically means that a new creative way a new creative way to solve an old problem destroys or gets rid of the old way right it's like uh, the forest fire right the clearing out the brush destroying the brush um, or, or burning down a forest destroying a forest allows for new birth to, to come up and so i believe like i said we're going to see an end to centralization, top-down control. That's what history shows us. That's what these cycles show us. Um, and we can see that happening. Um, you'll understand even more when I break down cycle number two um, on the next video. I believe we're gonna see an end to social engineering. And through social engineering, I'm talking about financial and monetary manipulation. I'm talking about the ability of central banks, the IMF, the Federal Reserve to print billions of dollars and give them to whoever they want, give them to their buddies on Wall Street, give them to special interest groups. That is the problem that we have. Um, and then of course, as I said, CBDC, central bank digital currencies, give them even more ability to do that, to control your behavior, control your actions through the money. Um, and I believe that we're going to see an end to this wealthy elitism. Now, I'm not talking, the, uh, I'm not trying to say that wealthy people are the problem. Um, I'm not trying to say that, um, I'm not trying to say that uh, there shouldn't be, you know, the ability to get ahead and to have more wealth than somebody else. I'm talking about wealthy elitism. I believe that we're going to have a move back to meritocracy. So when I say meritocracy, I mean that you're going to earn based off of your effort. So in college, you have the choice to go out and party every single night and screw off and sleep in. But your grades are going to show the impact of that, right? Um, or you could skip the parties and you could stay up and study all night and then you get good grades. And so based off the amount of effort that you put in, you reap the rewards of your effort. And that's how life is. Now, some people want to work way harder, want to work way more hours than I do. And you know what? If they work harder, they put in more hours than I'm willing to do, then they're going to get a little bit ahead. And I'm okay with that. I don't want to put that effort in. Not everybody should have to put the same effort in, right? They want to work harder. That's fine. But we should all reap the benefits of our efforts um, back to human nature, right? The ant has to store up for the winter. The lion has to run faster than the gazelle or it dies. The gazelle has to run faster than the lion or it dies. We have to sow before we reap. Those are natural laws. The problem is that we have wealthy elitism getting ahead based off of no production because they're close to the money spigot, because they can print themselves trillions of dollars and pass regulations that force you and I to hand them over our money. That's what causes wealthy elitism. We're gonna see into that. We'll see an end to this top-down approach, again, the centralized control, and instead we'll have this decentralized um, bottom-up approach. And ultimately, that gives us a whole new world. Of course, when, you, when we move into video two and number three, talking about the technological revolutions, and then, of course, the financial revolutions, it's all going to come very, very clear. But we have to understand how to navigate this correctly. Now, it's a blessing and it's a curse. We have the benefit of being alive to witness this in real time. History books will be written about this period in time. Just like I, I went back and I showed you events that happened in the last two different revolutionary cycles. People will be talking about this one. It's that big. 
Um, the benefit is that if we get this right, this can be the biggest opportunity of our lifetime. But if we don't get this right, if we ignore it or we get it wrong, it could end up very badly for us. Now, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, they didn't have to worry about this. They weren't at the edge of this 250 year revolutionary cycle, but you and I are. Again, it's a blessing and a curse. If you take advantage of it, then, then it can be good. Either way, it's gonna have massive implications for your life. Of course, I suggest that you turn this into a positive, but you have to understand all three. Now I built the case as to why politically, socially, culturally, we are changing and how those changes will drive technological changes, which will then drive financial changes. So you have to understand all three. And of course, at the end, after the third video, after I put all this together so you can understand it, I'm gonna give you all those actionable information. Um, now we went through this one, the PSE political, social, and cultural cycles and revolutions. The next video, we're gonna talk about the technological revolutions, not just cycles, not just technologies, technological revolutions. There's only been a handful of them in the last 250 years, of course, on this big cycle. And then ultimately we're gonna talk about the financial cycles and revolutions. Now, um, these are three videos I'm gonna do. Sorry, it went a little bit long. I am doing a free event where I'm gonna put all this together and show you exactly what I'm doing step-by-step step to navigate this next five, seven, eight years that are gonna be absolutely crucial to get right. Um, and if you wanna know what I'm doing and you wanna hear what, hear what the outcome, that thesis is, uh, there's a link in the description. You can sign up for my free event. Um, I'd love to have you there. We're gonna get deeper into that than I can go on just this video. All right, but stay tuned for video two and video number three. That's coming out where I'll break down the other two cycles. And of course, ask questions down below. I'm sure this has to have sparked some questions, right? I hope it has. And if so, ask those questions so we can have those conversations in the chat down below. And then of course, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it, because you know, I'm working hard. This is years and years and years, decades of my work right here. So hopefully you like it. If you don't like it, whatever, give me a thumbs down, I guess, but leave me a comment and let me know why. Share it with somebody else that you think could use it. Sign up for my free event in the description down below. And that's it. That's what I got for you today, all right? So to your success. I'm out.